One of the things that I should say before we get started is important to know about me. I have this radical kind of extreme and a little controversial approach to being a pastor. And it's different than a lot of people because what I believe is I should tell you guys the truth. I know. Hold with me just for a minute, though, before you guys walk out. Yeah, never go into politics. It's good advice. I don't believe that I should just tell you guys what you want to hear. I don't believe that I should either tell you guys what I think as if I knew it as a fact. So this is the radical perspective that I have, is that if I, if I feel something might be true, but I'm not sure, I'm going to tell you that. And if I feel something is probably not true, I'm going to tell you that too. If I don't know, guess what I'm going to say? I don't know. And we're dealing with lots of I don't knows today, but the first thing that I want to express is I don't like this, this story. I don't really like this story. And the reason that I don't like this story, and I'm sorry, Jesus, please don't strike me down, but the reason that I don't like this story is a few different reasons that I want to talk about today. So that's, this, is a, this is a message about why I don't like the message. That's what today's message is about. So one of the reasons that I don't like this message is because I personally am not motivated by what happens after this life. I believe this life is just a start. I believe that there is an afterlife, and I believe that there is heaven and all of that, I believe. Okay, I believe everything most Christians believe, but it doesn't motivate me. It really doesn't make me want to live any different. And the reason is, is because I think it's so important to focus in our life on what we can control. And you have this moment, this moment to control one thing. Does anyone know what that one thing you can control is? Yourself. And that's it. And frankly, you're not even great at that. Let's be honest. So I think we should spend all of our energy focusing on this moment. The only reason that looking at heaven and hell and all those things makes sense to me is so that I take this moment and use it as best as I can, knowing that I'm living not just for the pleasures of the second, but for the long run. That I'm investing this moment in the future. And I want to invest this moment as best I can for the best future that I can possibly have. And whether we're talking about 10 years from now or 10 billion years from now in inf infinity, right, it's still the same principle. There's some things that you can do in this life that will make you feel good at the moment, and tomorrow you're going to feel less good than you did the night before. And there's other things that you could do that are going to pay dividends and you get back again and again and again and again. And that's how we should live our life. That's what we should invest on is those things that happen later. Okay, I get that. Except look for the greater rewards in heaven. That's great. But the problem with heaven and talking about heaven is that we don't know so much. There's so many things we don't know. And we as people, especially as men, don't do well with ambiguity. We try to make things very clear and obvious. And, you know, if a wife tells us a problem, we tell her how to fix problem. They say that if your only tool is a nail or is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that's how some of us guys are in our relationships. We just, well, here my wife's got this problem. This is a nail. I've got a hammer. Bang, you know, right? And that doesn't go very well, does it, guys? Doesn't go very well, does it, guy? Okay. Some of you guys have still have to have that lesson learned in your relationship, apparently, because you're still trying to fix. No, we can't. And we can't figure out a lot of these things. So when I'm talking about some of this stuff about heaven and hell, we need to understand that the best we can do, as was written by the guy named Paul, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, most of the New Testament, he said, now we only see dimly, then we will see face to face. So the best we can do is kind of get this dim picture. There's a lot of different images people have about heaven. And some of these images are really helpful. I'm, I'm super fond 
of C.S. Lewis when he talks about heaven. Because his, his depiction of heaven is more solid. It's not like this wispy ghost thing where you kind of could walk through the person. It's actually more solid. And I love that image. Is that true? Is that what it's going to be like? I don't know. But I think that's a helpful image to think about. When I was part of a Bible study class thing when I was a little kid, there was this assignment that we got that we were supposed to draw a picture of what heaven would be like for us. And I drew a, a thing where instead of being paved with gold, the streets were paved with wrestling mats. That's right. Just wrestling mats on the floor and then wrestling mats on the walls. Now, the reason there were wrestling mats on the walls is because I thought about this and I thought, in heaven, there's probably not going to be the same sort of gravity. So we could probably wrestle on the walls too. That was the cool part about my, my heaven. It was just an eternity of wrestling. Yeah, I don't know what my dad did to me, but I'm still in counseling about it. The, he, he was my wrestling coach, and that's how bad our family was built to be wrestlers, that heaven to me was just a wrestling match that we could wrestle on the walls all, all of eternity. Man has time changed. Now I'd rather spend eternity in a rocking chair than on a wrestling mat. But I, I imagine if you ever said, hey, how many people have seen Inception? Have you seen Inception, the movie Inception? You know that rotating room that they were fighting in and they were all falling? And that was, that was like my vision of heaven is that it was this rotating wrestling room and that's the best that I could do. Now, I'm expecting that most of you agree with me that's probably not heaven, what heaven is like, and thank God. Anybody going to get an amen? All right. But one of the things I've thought about is that the Bible is written mostly by men. That's just reality. The Bible is written by most. And that might be part of the reason why when men were trying to picture heaven, they came up with the same image over and over again. Because they thought, okay, here's some logical deduction. Okay, God is love. And when we go to heaven, God is going to love us. And where do men mostly feel loved? On the football. Well, <laughs> I don't know. You, you got the tailgate in your head. No, it's when they're, when they're served food, right? The easiest way to a man's heart is through his. So what do they think heaven's going to be like? We're going to be eating a lot of food. <laughs> That's right. That's what they go to. It's just, it's, you know, we, there's a book called The Five Love Languages. And it talks about the, all these different ways that people are experienced love. And I asked my brother Robert, what is his love language? And he said, food. <laughs> Robert, that's not one of the options. Like, you know, it's all of the options. <laughs> he said, he said, when I'm loved, I feel words of encouragement. I feel touched. Uh, it's a service to me. They're spending time with me. It's everything. It's a gift. <laughs> I've got all of them right there in food. It's perfect. So that's, you know, that's a lot of guys love language is food. And so it's a feast. Now, it's probably actually not a feast because guys wrote it. it, it I actually think it's a great image. But part of it is because back in the day when this was first written, food wasn't something that was so readily available. Food was something that wealthy people had. Poor people didn't. And in people in poverty, and still in some places in the world, this is the case, are, are hungry and starving, waiting for food. So the idea of a feast was what wealth could buy. Nowadays, we think of wealth as mansions and cars. Back then, food was pretty good. That was a pretty high level right there, just all the food you could eat. And when it talks about this rich guy, that's one of the things he's talking about is just Lots and lots of food. This guy could eat all the time. And we're like, oh, man, he must have been really rich. He could eat whatever he wants. Oh, McDonald's, you don't have to be rich. That was thanks for McDonald's, okay? But, yeah, I know. No thanks to McDonald's. We're, we don't like McDonald's. But the point is, is that this feast has, has this wonderful image of what heaven is like. And the other thing that I love about the feast image, besides the fact that I get to eat a lot of food and I like that, Hopefully, we don't have to eat kosher there so I can have bacon. Otherwise, I'm really excited about the meal. But the other thing that's exciting about it is its family. When we feast together at a banquet and we're all having a party, we have community and we have family, and that's a huge part of what heaven is like. 
That's why when we are experiencing the, the closest thing to heaven, it's when we're getting together as a group. And that's one thing that I think, I don't know, but that's my feeling, is it's really about family. Now, when we talk about family, I think it's important to remember what kind of family we're talking about. Because a lot of people have different types of family. Nowadays, there's some people that they think of their family as people that never showed up when they needed them. People that were picky on them all the time. Maybe when you think of a brother, you think of someone that just picks on you. And if you look at my childhood, I know how you feel. <laughs> Trust me. But that's not what family really is. Maybe some of you think of family as abusive. But that's not what family really is. Family, brothers and sisters, and I have these brothers now that just took them a while to mature, but they are people that have your back no matter what. There are people that when you're broken, when you're, when you're down, when you're depressed, they don't go, oh, you're no, you're no fun to hang out with today. They're there for you because they care about you and they love you more than you love yourself, especially in that moment when you're super depressed. That's what a family is really all about. When Jesus had people say, hey, your family is telling you not to do this stuff. Why are you doing it? He looked at them and he said, who is my family? Who is my family? My family is the people that go and do the will of God. And what is the will of God? To, to love God and to love your neighbors as yourself. That's my family. That's what Jesus was saying. And the greatest gift that we have in church, and when church is done at its best, at its peak, it's when we have that. The greatest gift that the church can offer us in today, in this present moment, is that one stranger can walk into the church. Another stranger can walk, they can even walk one from the alley and one from the uh, doors. One rich, one poor, right? And they can be brothers. Eventually. It takes time. But as we build relationships and we get to know each other, we get that bond of brotherhood. Even the rich person in today's verse experienced that love of brothers because when he was in torment and he realized that he wasn't getting out of it, even for a second, his next thing was say, okay, but tell my brothers. Make sure my brothers know. Because even him, selfish in his life, loves his brothers. The difference is in Christianity, everyone in need is our brother or our sister. That's the difference. Not just the people that are biologically related to us. But Speaking about coming back and this idea of coming back, the second reason that I don't really like this verse is because it's clearly a ripoff. Jesus read Christmas Carol, and then he, was, he took the, the thing from Christmas Carol. Anybody right? No? Why, why don't you think that? It doesn't, don't you see the connection? Why isn't that what happened? <laughs> What do you mean? You don't think Jesus could have got his hand on a Christmas carol? He probably he wrote the Christmas carol. Yeah, actually, pro okay, fine. I'll give you this one. Maybe the Christmas carol was written more in uh, influenced by the story. But has anyone thought, thought about that when you're thinking about this verse of the Christmas carol? I don't know. I do. I, I, I frankly, I think of that, that rich guy. Now, if he went back from the dead instead of Lazarus, we'd basically have what we have in a Christmas Carol. Now, a Christmas Carol, the character is Scrooge. And one of the things I love about Christmas Carol is that it's, it's got Scrooge's psychology written in the story. Have you ever noticed that Scrooge gets a lot of money, but he doesn't live in the lap of luxury? He doesn't even make himself merry with all his money. And so you ask yourself, why? Well, it's actually written into the story. And that Scrooge was... was born as a very poor person that didn't have a lot of means, and he felt like he was never enough. He had this girl that he fell in love with, and he wanted to be her husband, but he felt like he didn't deserve her. She loved him, and he loved her, but he wasn't enough of a man because he was poor. And he got this image of himself not being enough because he was poor, so much written into his head that he decided that he was going to spend his whole life on trying to get all the money he could. And he became a hoarder, and guess what happened? No matter how much money he got, 
No matter how much prestige he got, it was never enough. All the riches not making him happy, not making other people happy, and not making him feel like he was enough. And that's one of the things when we get stuck in the trap of accomplishment. The trap of accomplishment is all about trying to feed this hole that we feel in our, uh, in our, in our soul that we're not enough, and it never gets filled. No matter how much accomplishment we pour into it, no matter how much we tell ourselves, I'm rich, so I'm successful. I'm, I, I, I've uh, won championships, so I'm successful. I've got a great job, so I'm successful. Whatever it is, it's never enough when we're trying to feed that insecurity. And that's the thing that happens to Scrooge. But then the dead rise to convince Scrooge that he should live his life different. And the first guy who comes to him is Bob Marley, right? Bob Marley comes up with, not Bob Marley? Who, who is it? Oh, Jacob. Well, I thought it was Bob Marley. You sure? He's got the dreads and everything. Goes in. Jamming. Oh, come on, jamming with me. Jamming, right? That's, that's what I picture the ghost coming and saying, right? It, it would work a lot quicker. I think Scrooge would be converted way quicker if it was Bob Marley instead of Jacob Marley. And just Charles Dickens, you know, you just make a note of that. No, it's Jacob Marley. Jacob Marley, who is his business partner and was super successful in, in money. And at one point when he's talking to Scrooge, he's saying, you have formed these chains in your life, link by link. Depending on the version, it's like, link by link, you formed the chain. You know, Goofy was actually my favorite. You know, you'll be visited by three ghosts. You know? But... As he's forming this link, he, the, Scrooge is really confused at first. He's like, wait a second, but, but jo Jacob, Bob, whatever your name is, Marley, man, you were awesome in life. You were really good at business. And what, is, what does Jacob say in response? Anybody know? Mankind yeah, mankind was my business. I don't have the thing memorized, and sorry about that. But I'll, uh, mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. That's the line from the novel. The dealings of my trade, how I earned a living, my job, were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of what is my business. What a great image. Just think about that. All the schooling you get to get the job that you have, to have the accomplishments that you have and the wealth in the world, all those things that Jacob did, his perspective now was of the what mattered in his life that was a drop of water. Just one little drop in the ocean. Now, we all live in Vero Beach, or at least we're all in Vero Beach at the time. We know what an ocean looks like, right? When you look into an ocean, what do you see? Fish. That happens later this week, Mark. Okay. I love how you're goal setting already. That's good. We see lots of water. And what is, what is the farthest thing we can see beyond water? More water or the sky. Either way, that's true. That's it. We just see more water. We look to the right. We look to the left. Do we see where the water ends? And then think of a drop of water. Just a little drop in the ocean of what is my business. And this is the reality of life. There's a pastor who used to say, money isn't important, it just rates up there with oxygen. It's a fact of life. We have to have money. Money is a part of how we buy things, we do things with it. And thank God, as much as people quote it all the time, the Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. Have you ever heard that? Anyone said, heard someone say money is the root of all evil? 
The love of money is the root of all evil. Living your life for money is the root of all evil. Not money. Money is a fact of life. Money is a drop of water. But living for that drop of water instead of the ocean of what life is really about, that's when we get off track. That's when we start wasting our life. Because if you think of that, and I think that's a pretty good value distribution model to think about, is if we're living all of our life and spending all of our attention, time, and energy, or even just the vast majority on this little drop of water when our entire business is this ocean, are we spending our resource responsibly? Are we a good steward of our life? If we're living for that drop, and our business is the ocean? No. No, we're living a foolish and stupid life. The third thing I don't like, now I'm with the goofy numbers, okay. The third thing I don't like about this uh, story is that I hear people all the time try to make it into something it's not. They don't want this parable to be a story about wealth. And so a lot of times, ever over and over, hear someone say, this is not really about wealth. Because all of us don't want to believe that it's hard for rich people to get into heaven. Why don't we want to believe that? Well, as much as we'd like to all pretend that we're poor, none of us relate to Lazarus. I mean, none of us. The homeless in this community cannot relate to Lazarus. Lazarus was starving, had no food except for the scraps. Now the scraps, by the way, was a specific item. It was bread, and it was bread that they didn't use for food. They would clean, they didn't have napkins, so they would clean the plate and the hands with the bread, and then they'd throw the bread out because it was too gross to eat. And then they would give it to the dogs. The dogs, by the way, were stray dogs, so these are not these well-groomed pet dogs we're talking about that are licking his sore. It was these, these street rat dogs that would, he'd have to fight with the dogs for these crumbs. That was the life that he lived in. In this community, we have the source, and I'm very honored to work with the source. The source is this great organization that helps people that are in need, poverty or homeless, it doesn't matter, the source is there for them. And the source gives three square meals a day, six days a week. One of their mottos is we take soup out of the soup kitchen. And what that means is we're, we're trying to help people dine with dignity. You go in the source, you're going to be seated down at a table, and then someone's going to come and bring food to you. And I can tell you, the food is wonderful. It's amazing. The food is really good almost every single day. Actually, someone, I don't know if you want me to mention it or not. Just take your care. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Someone helps prepare the food. It's here. And I won't mention it. He didn't say the hands up. So... Uh, but someone who helps pr prepare the food for these people is here. And they prepare wonderful food. And they do a great job of serving these people who need to know that they matter. Who need to know that they have people that are there for them in their corner that have family. Statistically, people are 70% more likely to succeed if they have one person they know is in their corner. Just one person they know is there for them and cheering them on. It doesn't mean that that one person can solve the problems. We is going out and trying to be that one person, which if we're following Jesus, it's what we have to do. If we want to be that one person for someone else, we can't fix their problems. Because you know who we're not? God or them. We can't control them. They can control them. They're not very good at it, so they need God. Those are the two elements that exist to get someone successful, but what we can be there is we can be there for them. And just being there for them, even if we're not great at it, is proven to be 70% more likely that they will be successful in their life. And that's what this verse is really about. It's about what Bob or Jacob, I still think Bob, that's my image in my head, is convinced that life is really about. The living that we're doing today is about who are you living for? What is your 
business? What is the business of your life? There's this guy, and some people don't like his response. I get it. I've heard some people, when I've shared this story, they just focus on the fact that the guy probably didn't have a job. But I met this guy who was like one of those hippie guys in a coffee shop. And I went and I, and I said, hey, you know, what do you do? I mean, we already introduced each other and I knew his name and everything. And he said, what do you do? And he said, I hate that question, man. I do lots of things. I garden. I play the guitar. I write poetry. I do lots. I talk to people. I eat things. This is the thing. I do lots of things, man. And it, okay, maybe he just didn't have a job and he felt guilty about that. Maybe that's true. But I loved that answer. I thought, you know, there's some truth to that. We focus so much on who we are as what we do, but it's not. It's not. My dad told me that when I was struggling with trying to figure out what I was supposed to do with my life. He said, honestly, Richard, God is much more, much, God cares a lot more about who you are than what you do, than how you do it, than within what that task is you're doing. You can be the most God-honoring janitor in the world or the most hellacious CEO in the world. You can be the greatest failure and being a lawyer who is really good at their business but forgets that mankind is their real business. Or you could be a great lawyer and, and good at that. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, all lawyers are going to hell. I just, you know, uh, there's a percentage, I don't know what that number is, that are good lawyers. But what are we going to do with the success that we're given in our life is a, a, a much greater question. Because as much as we'd like to say we're Lazarus, we're poor, we're struggling, let's be honest, we have more in common with the rich person. We can eat as much as we want. We are not wondering what our next meal is coming. In fact, we know our next meal is the tailgate party that's right after the service, and you can all come and go ahead and join in on that after the service. So we know where our next meal is coming from. No one is going to be hungry today, well, unless we run out of food, and then we'll have to start ripping up fish and, and, and making bread and stuff like that. But we have our needs provided. So the question is, how are we going to live our life? One thing that's interesting is that the poor guy, his name is Lazarus. What's the rich guy's name? Apparently you guys don't know your Bible well enough. No, I'm just kidding. Mike is right. Mike, of course, is the one person that's like, trick question, immediately. That's just Mike. He knows everything. But uh, that's right. It, it doesn't say. The rich man's name isn't given. In fact, the weird thing is that, that the Lazarus name is given because it's the only parable that any name is given. And it's given the, the, the name Lazarus. Lazarus means God has helped. And I think that's a huge part of the key to how we should live this life is aware of our need for God helping. And in this present moment, even if we are in difficulty and struggling, remembering that God helps us. Remembering that God has a, a plan to prosper us. We have a future and a hope. And if you do feel like you're in that place where you're in a, a situation where it's beyond your control and you're struggling and you're suffering, remember that tomorrow is coming. This is not the end. And God has a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. God is going to get you through this difficulty. It's really important to remember. But the other thing I want to point out about Lazarus is what its name sounds familiar to me. There's a, there's a part where Jesus said, even if the dead were to rise, then they still wouldn't believe. When he asked to have, have them go and talk to my brothers so that they would believe. And then the, he says, even if the dead rise, we will not believe. The dead rising, Lazarus. So, rings a bell? Maybe? In John, Jesus records the greatest miracle that he performed before he died. 
which is raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus raising from the dead. And even then, a lot of people didn't believe him. I think a lot of times we convince ourselves that the reason that we aren't living this Christian life is because there's just not enough evidence that we're going to be taken care of. It's really that we just don't trust God to take care of us because we want to control it. That's, you know, there was a rich guy who I talked to one point, and it was very fascinating because I've always been baffled by some wealthy people. There's the Scrooge types that are trying to make up for themselves and how they feel in the inside. I get that. But then there's other people that keep getting more and more things, and they have more than they could ever spend. And I wonder, why are they, why are they still trying to get more money? And this guy explained it to me. He said, my dad raised me to say that in life, the person who has the most money can control the most people. And the people, and the person that controls the most people wins in the end. So if you want to be successful in life, get the most money so that you can control people. And it's the first time I thought about that, and I thought, wow, I'd be a lot of, there, there might be an evil twin Richard out there if I wasn't raised by my dad, who said the opposite, basically, on how I should live my life. I, I, and I, it actually gave me some sympathy because I thought about that. I'm like, what a, what a horrible way to go through life. Because here's the thing. Controlling people means you can't be loved by them. God knows that. That's why he gave us freedom of choice. And all the horrible things that happen in this world is because of freedom of choice. But that's how important it is to have real love. And real love is only possible with freedom. So anyone who's living for money to control people can never experience real love. They have put a wall between them and any authentic relationship. What a sad and horrible way to go through life. That you're so focused on what you can control that you're losing out on what God can give. Because that's the choice. It ultimately comes down to, am I going to live for myself and what I can control of life? Or I'm going to trust God for the future that he has for me. Even when he's calling me to walk this direction that, that is difficult and, and makes me walk against the direction that gives me money. Are we happy with the life we've chosen, Ebenezer? I don't know about you, but I am. I am because when I look in the faces of many of you, and some of you I, I'm just meeting, and I know that as I meet you guys, you guys are going to be awesome. We're going to get to know each other, and we're going to become like family. But a lot of you I've known for a while, and you guys are so precious and wonderful of gift to me in my life. You guys are brothers and sisters that I didn't have, but God has given me through this ministry and that's more precious that's my business that's what my business is really all about and it doesn't end here it just gets better and bigger and more grander the more we invest in that business the more we live for the ocean instead of the drop the more we focus on God's love instead of our own accomplishments that's what this life is all about, and that's what this story is all about. So there's reasons why I don't like the story. But in the end, I love the message. The message is, as we go through difficulty, taking the harder road, we remember that our future treasure is so great, it so surpasses all of our present difficulties, that it makes it all more than worth it. Let's pray.